welcome everybody. This is, uh, I, for those I may not have met, I'm Michael Berger. Um, and we had an opportunity to study together on Sunday. And that session was really to explain why the form of Judaism that the rabbis developed and became the dominant uh, form of religious life for Jews up till the modern period had a lot of discomfort with traditional messianism. When I say traditional messianism, I mean Second Temple, because okay, that's what was traditional for them. And they were trying to dampen the messianic uh, fervor by rendering messianism utopian, miraculous, God will take care of it, right? They emphasized, this just to repeat, emphasized the biblical notion of covenant. If we return to God, God will return us to Zion. Uh, God will take care of bringing the Messiah, re, uh, shift the emphasis of Hanukkah from the military victory to the, victory of, to the miracle of oil, and spiritualize the attachment to the land rather than make it something that's political and military and physical. Okay? That's where we left. And what we were, the question I posed at the end was well, if now active Zionism um, which is, I realize, an anachronistic term, but some kind of active effort to come to the land is inconsistent with religious Judaism, then how do we have something called religious Zionism? Right? That's the question I want to address, uh, I want to address today. Okay? So we talked about this. The process begun during the Second Temple period. We saw that law took over land. It's kind of knocked out land, and now the land is only a spiritual connection. And really, the Sinaitic triadic covenant of God, Torah, and people was now the basic core of rabbinic Judaism. Okay? Um, what I'm going to share with you today can be found in this book. By the way, stuff on Haredim can also be found uh, on this book. Aviezer Ravitsky um, was I mean, a religious phil a philosopher of religion as well as a, uh, I think he was the provost of Hebrew University. I mean, he was, uh, he was up there. And um, he wrote this book, and it was translated, he wrote it in Hebrew, it was translated into English, and so kind of the standard uh, text for what we're going to talk about today, okay? So on your handouts, I think you have it. Uh, okay, Judy, here. All right. On the, uh, on the first page, I just want to explain that we have now several texts that have entered the canon of religious Judaism that reflect and, and embody what we spoke about on Sunday. So for instance, um, in the interest of time, because we don't have a whole lot of it, I'll just read it quickly. The Talmud in Ketubot says a person should always live in the land of Israel, even in a city whose majority is idolaters, and not live outside, because it says if you don't have a God. So there was this emphasis in some circles about living in uh, the land. However, Rav Yehuda, who was a sage in the third century Babylonia, look what he wrote or said. Anyone who goes up from Babylonia to the land of Israel violates a positive commandment, as it is said, to Babylonia they will be brought and there remain until I remember them, says the Lord. That verse from Jeremiah, by the way, is talking about the vessels of the temple. But he took it to mean, we're in Babylonia now, we were exiled, stay put. Do not, right? and that's a strong language, violates a positive commandment. I can't uh, emphasize that enough. But this is the mother of all uh, sources. Uh, and we'll talk about it actually when we do the Haredim, for uh, the view of Rabbi Yossi, son of Rabbi Hanina, right, who said, why do these three oaths appear in the Song of Songs, the book of Shira Shirim? One is that Israel should not rise up against the wall. I put that in quotation marks because it's a euphemism. We're not sure exactly what it means. One, that the Holy One, blessed be he, made Israel swear not to rebel against the nations of the world. And one, that the Holy One, blessed be he, made the nations of the world swear not to overly subjugate Israel. So these three oaths are considered by many so ultra-Orthodox Jews to be real. Not Agadah, not Midrash, not a story, 
I'm talking about literally the rabbis are saying you are forsworn from going up to Israel like a wall, which means understood militarily. We are forsworn from rebelling against the nations of the world, right? to sort of fight against them and to resist them. So it's very, very strong language. This is what many ultra-Orthodox Jews um, and even re regular religious Jews said when Zionism emerged. You're going against the oaths. You're going against that right, positive commandment that Rabbi Yehuda said. How could you do that? You're violating it. So I just want to sum up what, what needed to be overcome to create this hybrid called religious Zionism. So we have the three oaths. You, you need to answer that. You can't just say, if you were secular, you just said, that's the Talmud, I have, that has nothing to do with me. But if you believed in the Talmud, you felt it had authority for you, you had to respond to the charge in some way. Um, the second point is some, one that came out of our talk on Sunday. This contradicts the Jewish view that the Messiah, Messiah will come in a miraculous way from God. We don't lift a finger. That was the response in the second century and was the primary motivation for the quiescence, what we said, the passive attitude of most Jews towards even oppression. Can't resist, can't try to go up yourself, you have to wait for God. Practically, most Zionists were secular. And that meant for a religious Jew, if you're going to get into bed with the Zionists, then you're really uh, joining forces with people who not, uh, and I, this is not true today. Most early Zionists were not non-religious. They were anti-religious. So you're really getting into bed. You're making common cause with people who think you should disappear, that you are not the real form of Judaism. You're certainly not what's going to build this country. So that's not a small thing. And then I just want to emphasize this. The early responses of the religious were very perceptive. They said, you know what Zionists are doing? What did we do? I have to just go back to a few slides. What did we do? We made land secondary and spiritual and the law, the triad as God, people, and the law. What did the Zionists want to do? They want to bring that back. They want to put law back into the vertex here, the vort, right, one of the vertices, of the triangle and say law is secondary. Law was necessary. If you listen to the early Zionists, why was halakha necessary? Kept us united, kept us together, kept us longing for Israel, for the land. But now that we're back and we're, we're building a country, we don't need halakha anymore. We don't need Jewish law. So just going back to where we were, listen to what the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe uh, had said very powerfully. In order to infuse our brethren with the idea of being a nation, this is on your handouts. Uh, we are on the bottom of page one, I believe, correct? Okay. Um, in order to infuse our brethren with the idea of being a nation and an independent polity, the Zionists must give nationalism precedence over the Torah because it is known that those who cling to the Torah and the commandments are not likely to change and accept another identity. This is before the idea of multiple identities was <laughs> right now we could do that. But in those days, especially such as is implied in leaving exile by force and redeeming themselves by their own power against the oaths. Hence, in order to implement their idea, the Zionists must distort the essence of Jewishness in order to get the Jews to assume a different identity. Powerful. Distort. Just think about that. The word distort, right? Because... For 1,800 years, rabbinic Judaism had emphasized that Torah was our essence, and that's why we can survive without a land, because our essence isn't compromised. Is it the ideal? No. But can we survive? For sure, because we have Torah. It's very powerful. Pa uh, actually, in the year 1900. Exactly the year 1900. Okay? So then, 
early religious Zionists, and we'll, we'll uh, go over a few, started to say things like, well, it's, there are answers, there are responses to the objections. First, the three oaths is not a halachic, it's not a legal formulation. It could be taken non-literally. And remember, there were three oaths, two to the Jews and one to the Gentiles. Well, what was one of the major impetuses for Zionism in the 1880s? Right, the pogroms are terrible. At the Eastern Europe, it was horrible. And then even ultimately, 1893, sorry, the Dreyfus Affair, that gets Herzl on board in a political way, but masses of Jews left Eastern Europe because it was simply intolerable and it was getting dangerous to stay. So it says, if they would keep their oaths not, their oath not to subjugate us too, too severely, then we'll stay put. But look what they're doing. We have no choice but to sort of go against the oaths that, that we were pledged to keep. A very important thing here is, is Messianism utopian? Absolutely. Is it in God's hands? Ultimately. We can, you know, remember the old uh, automobiles? You had to crank it up, you know, in the beginning, and then when it got... And then you ran to the, to, the, uh, to the steering wheel, and you could get going with the gas, right? You could put it into gear. That's what we're doing. The messianic process is in God's hands. All we're doing is cranking it a little. And so the messianic is not, process is not momentary. It's not instantaneous. It's gradual. And we can get involved in the early stages. That's human. That's not against Jewish tradition. But then God will kind of step in and miraculously take over the process. Right? That was... Uh, so I want to highlight what would have been seen as a messianic process is now deferred to as a messianic goal, right? Ultimately, God will do it, but right now, we're not engaged in it. Yes? Mostly not. No. Mostly Lithuanian, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Okay, the question was, were the early uh, religious Zionists coming out of the Hasidic uh, milieu or more... Uh, the yeshivish from Lithuania, from the yeshiva world, and yes, it was the yeshiva world. In fact, we'll see that the uh, first movement was uh, launched in Vilna, okay? Which is the, well, that was the Jerusalem of Lithuania, okay? Lastly, this is a little bit more of a trust. We could deal with secularists on a pragmatic level. Ideologically, we're not getting into bed with them. We're simply making common cause. And we all know every time there's a revolution, a lot of people join together, and then when they actually win, that's when the ideological tensions kind of resurface. But initially, we want to get the job done. And we can, wait, what do we want to do? We want to build the land. But we may need to do it separately. Common cause, but separately. What do I mean? You want to build a kibbutz. That's great. We believe in building kibbutzim also. But what are we going to do? We're going to build a religious kibbutz. Right? So we believe in the socialist ideal, but we have to do it separately because we have different ways of running our lives. We believe in Zionist youth movements. But what are we going to do? We're going to have our own religious Zionist youth movement, B'nai Akiva. Right? So obviously there was Beitar, right? There were all these Zionist youth movements. We're going to do what you do, but on a separate and parallel track. We're not rejecting what you do. In fact, we affirm it. But we have to kind of do it in our way. All right? And the last point is, and this is phenomenal, because this is a real, right, I think, a kind of ideological revolution. Nationalism is part of authentic Judaism. The diasporic idea that it's all Torah, that's something that is an aberration of Tanakh. We're going back by bringing out the Tanakh and saying, come on, you can't read the story without realizing they want to end up in the land and Joshua and, and King David and right, Saul, David, Solomon, and even Ezra. It's all about getting back to the land. That's what we're doing. We want to get back to the land. That was the ideal. We put the ideal on hold because it was impractical. But don't hide, don't cover, don't smother the ideal just because we've been doing it for 1,800 years. Okay? So, uh, you know, 
almost every ideological debate is like, we're authentic. No, we're authentic, right? Then <laughs> that's uh, so. Yes. I'm sorry, I might have missed that at the beginning. But what are the three Yeah, it was a Talmudic passage based on uh, three verses that are almost identical in the book of Song of Songs, the the story uh, called Shira Shirim. It says, "Hishpati lach etchem benot Yerushalayim." I made you swear the doors of Jerusalem, and the three oaths were that the Jews will not militarily. Uh, try to conquer the land, they will not rebel against the nations, and that the non-Jews would not overly subjugate the Jewish people. Those are the three oaths. It's on your handout on the uh, middle of the lower half of the first page. Okay, it's in Ketubot. Okay, Yitzchak Yaakov Reines, about this fusion. Anyone who thinks the Zionist idea is somehow associated with future redemption, this is on your sheets as well, I think it's on page two. Uh, Is that right? Yes, right? Okay, the top of page two. Anyone who thinks the Zionist idea is somehow associated with future redemption and the coming of the Messiah, and who therefore regards it as undermining our holy faith is clearly in error, right? When, I'm not telling you that we have a different view. It says that you, you're, you don't understand. Zionism has nothing whatsoever to do with the question of redemption. <laughs> Think about that. I mean, if you talk to the secular Zionists, they had a very new view of redemption. He says, no, 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 this is, right, this is going on for, on a practical level. The entire point of this idea, here it is, is merely the improvement of the condition of our wretched brethren. Right? Eastern Europe. You can't imagine how bad it was. We want to ameliorate their condition. We want to improve their circumstances. We want to do that practically. What's wrong with helping other Jews improve their circumstances? Right? It's not... In recent years, our situation has deteriorated disastrously, and many of our brethren are scattered in every direction to the seven seas, places where the fear of assimilation is hardly remote. That was another way of talking about America, right? <laughs> okay? No, because you have to remember, millions were going over to, to the United States or Australia. I mean, it was, it was, they needed to South Africa. The Zionists thought that the only fitting place for our brethren to settle would be in the Holy Land, and that's, you know, what's wrong with that? Okay? So, Rhinus and others found the Mizrahi movement, and this is one of the biggest misnomers, Mizrahi has nothing to do with the East. It's an acronym for Merkaz Ruchani, spiritual center. And here's what they wanted to say. Let the secular Zionists build the land and we'll cooperate, but if we absent ourselves, if we recuse ourselves from the project, how will Israel be a spiritual center for world Jewry? Our whole point is that they're assimilating. We have to make a land where the Jews can thrive. So let the Zionists build the edifice. We will provide the spiritual contents. That was the delegation. That was the sharing of responsibilities the way religious Zionists saw it. So we're not giving the, the secular Zionists you know, the chance to control everything, but we, if we don't participate, they'll end up making it a very anti-religious society, and we want to prevent that. Okay? All right, listen to their mission statement. It should also be on your, uh, in the middle of the uh, first, second page, excuse me. In the nations of the diaspora, it is no longer possible for our nation to breathe. That is, it is impossible for us to follow the Holy Torah and to live a life according to the commandments, which are the basis of our spiritual well-being. Very practical. And to God, the pur their purity. We have not found any other way for our Torah to exist after Zion is rebuilt, except by guarding the true Judaism in all its aspects and in all its purity. I love this. Zionism and Torah are two holy vessels which complement one another and need one another. We lift the banner of religion, and by being Zionists, we can participate in the project. If we reject, it's not complementary anymore. Then it's oppositional. But we're here to actually join, uh, join forces. And in a similar way, Zev Yavetz, the platform of Mizrahi, rests upon its desire to impress upon the hearts of the... Look, we're the bridge builders. Look at the language. We impress upon the hearts of those opposed to Zionism a love of Zion. We'll talk to our religious colleagues and tell them it's okay to go to the land and build it. While at the same time to create in the heart of the irreligious Zionists 
a love for the Jewish religion. We can help both. We are the mediators. We can turn to religious people because we're also observant and tell them Zionism is okay. We can turn to the Zionists because we're participating in the kibbutzim and in the building and the army. Because we're participating, we can tell them religion is not something to be scared of or something to suppress. Okay? It would be our wish, said Yavetz, to take these two and to synthesize them into one total Judaism, thereby having a complete creation, one which retains the Torah as its soul, the nation as its body with its place in Israel, in the land of Israel. Very, very powerful uh, notion in a, in a period of ideological ferment called the late 19th, early 20th century. Okay? Any questions before we go to the sort of the next leap in this? Right. So you can see that there's something very practical about it. And there's also a sense of ideological uh, purity. What is the role of the secular Zionists to build the body? Yeah, Judy? Right, but I don't think statehood was, you know, the, well, like, wasn't even the, I don't think that was the primary goal yet. Right, so I think it was like an ultimate goal, but it wasn't about, it was about, I hate to use the word, autonomous regions, right? <laughs> Something that we really want to give the Palestinians. They conceived of having some kind of like province within the empire that they would have some, uh, but yeah, because, but it's also, if you're not present, you're not going to have a say. I think at this time, most Zionists, they didn't yet have the, the dream of full statehood. I think some did. Yeah. Without a doubt, some did. They thought, right, Herzl really thought that they needed to be uh, political Zionists. But Achar Ha'am thought you had to be a cultural Zionist before you could be a political Zionist. Okay. With Avraham, Isaac, Cohen, Cook, things really change in religious Zionism. What happens? He creates a new level of ideology that not only supports the religious, it creates a role and a positive role for the secular Zionists. Why is this so important? Because people like Rhinus and Yavetz, as the secular Zionists begin to settle the land and build it up, religious Zionists are forced to say, we admire them, but ultimately we have to hold our nose at their anti-religious stance. Cook takes that in a different direction. He says, because he had a Hegelian idea, this idea of synthesis, antith uh, sorry, thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis, he actually saw that what the secular Zionists were doing was part of the messianic process and a critical one, okay? Because he's a mystic, right? he has a rote, he has, uh, most of his material, by the way, was published posthumously. He was a, a thinker, he was a poet, he was a luckless. he became the chief rabbi of Jaffa in 1904 and then of Palestine um, after, uh, in the time of the mandate. Three months after he comes to Jaffa, Herzl dies. He gives a eulogy for somebody who basically hadn't been in a synagogue since his bar mitzvah. Herzl died at the age of 44, right? What are you doing eulogizing this radically secular Zionist? So listen to what Cook says. As redemption approaches, brazenness increases. A storm gathers, breaches appear everywhere. Why are so many people leaving religion? Because it's part of the messianic ferment. It's getting close, so the world is going crazy. Audacity breeds audacity. Look at all these people. They, okay, they wouldn't go to shul on Yom Kippur. Now they're having a ball on Yom Kippur. They're, actually having, they're called Yom Kippur balls. I mean, they actually had these, and, and they would eat ham like on Yom Kippur, just like to rub it in the face of the religious. These fiery spirits assert themselves, refusing to be bound by any limitation. 
I think this is uh, on the bottom of the second page. The weak who inhabit the world of order, the moderate and well-mannered, meaning the religious, are intimidated by them. But the strong know that this show of force comes to rectify the world, to invigorate the nation, humanity, and the world. It is only in the beginning that it appears in the form of chaos. Ultimately, it is to be taken away from the wicked and given to the righteous, valiant as lions they be. These storms will bring abundant rain. These dark clouds will be the vessels of great light. What a mystic can do is say, this is what looks like reality, but I'm going to tell you what's really going on. You know, you can't see it. Because on the surface, it looks like, oh, they're anti-religious, they oppose everything. It says, no, they're part of the messianic plan. They are invigorated. We have been dormant. We've been focusing on the study hall and we've been writing commentary on Talmud. We've been doing a great job in that. But we have to stir up our, our dormant powers and energies. How do you do that? In the world of Hegel, the dialectical world, we need a dialectical opposite so that the synthesis, we need to agitate and, and arouse these sleeping powers of the Jewish people. That they needed to be dormant for a reason, but by now, they, you have to like shake them. Like literally, like, do you, or slap them, you know, like, like, like the slap, you know, wake them up. He says, you have to be awakened from your slumber, and that's what the religious, the, sorry, the secular Zionists are doing. They're rejecting everything because that's the antithesis. The synthesis will be religious Zionism. Even the non-religious, the anti-religious will come to acknowledge the truth of religion. In its old form, they couldn't do that. So they rebel, they, they revolt, they, they, uh, uh, they reject, but in the end, the power is going to be taken away from the white, wicked and given to the righteous. And he thought the whole world was going in this direction. Okay? By the way, this is Herzl's eulogy, 1904. There hasn't been World War I yet. Now, it's important because they really thought progress, technology, it was like inexorable. There is an essential inherent good, right, top of page three, and, uh, in the world, and it is increasingly being lifted up. He could believe that. It is to be found in human nature and the human will as well. It's not just in Torah. It's across humanity. In the past, they were wilder. These were wilder than they are now, and in the future, they will be more fully developed than they are now. In other words, progress. As the human spirit develops, man's intellect and volition aspire more and more to the absolute good, which is the divine good. So again, it may look like a... Watch it, does anybody sail here? I'm in Atlanta. We don't sail anyway. All right? But if you sail on the ocean where there's like wind, you have to tack. You can't go straight. You have to go like this. And then if you want to move forward, you go like this. That's how you move forward in sailing. So that's what's happening now. We went like this, and now the second designers are going to tack this way, but in the end, we're moving forward. So this dialect between the religious and the, and the secular. Yes? Uh, uh, was this a view that he had uh, nurtured personally? Yes. It was not found in any... Mm. Well, you could find it in certain forms of mysticism, but he was the one, he actually read Hegel, he read philosophy broadly, and he kind of incorporated it into his Jewish worldview. It was really, it's, that's why, he was a revolution. He really, he really was. But if you look at this, the art school, Betzalel Art School in Jerusalem, okay? He could say, that's bringing back the aesthetic sense of the Jews. We focused on writing, okay, so text, 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 text. But we know that originally, Betzalel made the tabernacle and there were all these craftsmen and artists. Right? Bring that back. Look at, just think about this. The Betzalel Art School, its, its emblem, its logo is the Ark, right? Betzalel, right? So look, at, and these are idyllic pictures of the land and this is Queen Esther. I mean, he thought that you could take this as well as music, as well as poetry. He wrote a lot of poetry uh, himself. Architecture, all of this could be incorporated into the Zionist uh, vision, even of the religious. And he, he carried that forward. 
Look at this letter to Betzalel School. It's part of the revitalization of Judaism. Right? The renaissance of Jewish art and beauty in the land of Israel. It's is remarkable to see our multi-talented brethren, geniuses of beauty and art. Very few people thought they were Jews that were you know, geniuses of beauty and art. Certainly none who were religious who find fitting places in the wide and elevated boulevards of public life and an elevated spirit move them to bring them to Jerusalem to decorate our holy city. Again, a dialectical worldview, bring the artists and have them uh, sort of uh, elevate the, the, uh, the public sphere with their, uh, I think, ori religiously oriented uh, art. Academics, what about a university? He came to the dedication of Hebrew University. That's him right there, if you can see him. It's okay, he's, a, right? he's in his big fur hat and his beard. He's speaking at the dedication. There weren't many religious people there. Certainly none dressed like him. But he could find that in, in advancing culture and knowledge, I mean, think about it. Before there's a country, before there's a state, there's a university. I don't know of any other country that, that kind of uh, did that, yeah? Of a technical, a technical college, technical college. No, but this was for the you know, this is philosophy. Like this is just for all all knowledge, okay? And it was brilliant. He loved the fact that it, they taught in Hebrew. That they rejected doing it in German to show that it's not a foreign implant. This is the Jews unleashing their powers, okay? So uh, I just, he died in 1935. He never dealt um, with the Holocaust, and certainly not with the state building of 1945 to 19. Uh, pre-1945 to 1948. The National Religious Party became the next iteration of the religious Zionist ideal. So we lose Cook's messianic, mystical ideology. Right? It just kind of drops off the map. There's a lot to do in the country. Right? People are not doing uh, tons and tons of religious ideology. There's rehabilitating the refugees from Europe. There's, a, right, there's fighting seven armies. There's a lot to do. The National Religious Party says our goal is to simply right, adopt a pragmatic religious Zionism. What does that mean? Maftal is mefleget dati umi, the National Religious Party. Preserve the religious character of the country so that the religious will be able to participate. Meaning if the army is not kosher, if the, inst the buildings, the, the national buildings are... Uh, are don't have kosher food. If they're open on Shabbat, the religious will have to recuse themselves. If we ensure that there is at least accessibility for the religious, then we'll be able to participate. Okay, so that's the second bullet. Religious services to the public. And during, this is remarkable. During the 1950s and 70s, to, right, so 30 years, NRP always had 10 to 12 seats in the Knesset, which represented roughly that 10% of the population and usually controlled as part of their coalition agreement ministries of religious affairs and the interior. Why do you want the ministry of the interior? Status. We want to control marriage and conversion and divorce. So we want the marriageability of all Jews to one another. That's something we want to preserve. And most chief rabbis up till the 1980s affiliated with this movement. Yosef Borg is a very famous, he was interviewed. Somebody asked him, you know, your party is the national religion, dati with me, with a, with a, with a hyphen. Um, so he said, where do you feel more comfortable, on the national side or on the religious side? And his answer was, I feel most comfortable on the hyphen. <laughs> right, which is, I, and he was a bridge builder. He really was, uh, Avram Borg is his son. So. Okay. Um, NRP accomplished a lot. The Bnei Akiva youth movement was under its auspices. They established, they helped establish the status quo. Uh, does everybody know what I mean by the status quo agreement? That, you know, be closed on Shabbat, there'll be kosher food in the, in the army um, and the interior ministry. So that's, uh, that's the other thing. And they also launched the Hesder movement. Why? The, the two primary organs of assimilating into the Zionist ideology were the school system and the army. They wanted to protect their youth from adopting 
the secular Zionist um, ideology entirely. So they said, we've got a separate school system. We're going to have, there's, there's two, originally there were two religious, sorry, two national uh, school movements. There's Mamlachti, right, the, the secular, and then Mamlachti Dati. So there were, uh, public schools were either secular or religious, so religious families would send their kids to the, um, uh, the religious uh, uh, public schools. But then they wanted, in the army, they found that even after 12 years of education, many kids would get into the army. It was a three-year service. They would come out much less religious, if at all. So they wanted to shore them up, and they created the Hesder movement. Hesder means arrangement. The first one was 1953. And there, uh, you balance yeshiva and army service. Instead of serving three years, you serve five. And it's sort of this, you go into the yeshiva, then you go into the army, then you go into the yeshiva, then you go back into the army. And it's, it's, it's an evolving thing. We're not going to, we could give a whole class just on the history of that. And the second one was 1961. And the goal was to integrate the religious into Israeli society while preserving their religiosity. Yes. Yes. Philosophy and I, it to although Hirsch was not a Zionist. No, 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 right, 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 right. The, the pragmatic. It was pra- the pragmatic part. Right, exactly. Okay? But that's why like, they, they would start their own schools, they start their own yeshiva. They, they wanted to preserve that, that uh, separation, even as they integrated in other ways. Right? And so, this sort of the model, I think this is from the Lebanon War, right? uh, just that model of. Uh, in uniform, but praying, wearing tefillin, or in talit, uh, tarava avodah, b'nei akiva, these are the symbols of the religious Zionists. Except there was a fringe of religious Zionism that was much, much more ideological, and um, this is a book of his essays, Torat Eretz Yisrael, the teachings of Harav Tzvi Yehuda HaKohen Cook. It was Rav Cook's son, uh, who was relatively young when his father died, but look at how he viewed 1948. The divine historical imperative of the, of the purified and revealed end of exile cannot be altered in any way. Remember that dialectic, that inexorable progress? Neither by the evil machinations of the Gentiles, which he thought was the UN, um, or our own internal deviations, the secular. These may cause delays and short detours, but they cannot turn back our progress which advances with absolute certainty. And he wrote that in 1948. But in 1967, who could disagree? Miraculous, six days, triple the, the land mass, get back the whole patriarchal Hebron, Jerusalem, the old city, Nablus. I, it was all like the biblical Israel was back in uh, Jewish hands. We have returned home by divine command to the city of our temple, from today onwards, we will not move from here. So what was a messianic process, which we could help start, but God would take care of the goal, now Cook claims it's starting to merge. We are living, we are executing the messianic process closer and closer to its goal. And indeed, it's not just us, right? The army is doing it for us. The secular government is doing it for us because God works in this mysterious way that it looks like one thing, but it's really happening on another plane. And his students started Gush Emunim in 1974 after the debacle of the Yom Kippur War, and there was a lot of uh, self-doubt and and demoralized uh, Jews in Israel. They create a new platform. This is what it is. Am Yisrael, the Eretz Yisrael, al Torah Israel, the nation of Israel, in the land of Israel, living according to the Torah of Israel. To bring about a major spiritual reawakening in the Jewish people for the sake of the full realization of the Zionist vision, meaning we're going to, bring, we're going to realize the Zionist vision by our doing the spiritual, not waiting for God, in the knowledge that this vision's source and goal in the Jewish heritage and in Judaism's roots are the total redemption of both the Jewish people and the whole world. That's an echo of Rav Cook Sr., that it's also a redemption for the whole world. We can't go into it, but it's a fascinating dimension. This all comes from, from, these, uh, from this book. This is the part of the order of creation, that this air, these mountains and hills, these stones and plants, 
And all of the Almighty's creation in this portion of the globe are uniquely connected to us, the Jewish people. The divinely chosen nature of our nation and of our land is integral to the understanding of Kla Yisrael, meaning the the, uh, uh, community of Israel. The establishment of Jewish sovereignty over the land of Israel is a fundamental precept of the Torah. You know, I remember like the other ones, they're like, don't commit idolatry, don't murder, don't commit adultery, right? Nope. Jewish sovereignty is now one of the big ones that you would be martyred for. But the genuine keeping of the Torah is only in Eretz Yisrael. And I remember being in Israel in the early 80s, and people said to me, why are you going back? And he says, you can't be a Jew in, in America. And, and they said it with all seriousness. Like, you're here, just stay. Because you're inauthentic. And it, 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 you know, an impressionable 18, 19-year-old, it, it, it does strike a, a painful chord, okay? Look at the expansion of Yeshivot Hezder. Okay, so in 1967, not surprising, Yeshivat HaKotel, right, the Western Wall, Yeshivat HaRetzion in the Gush Etzion block that had fallen in 1948, the day before they, the independence was declared, they, they create one. 1972, Kiryat Arba, what's the message? Right, okay. This is the land, the, right, the biblical land, Hagolan, we're going to uh, uh, the heights that we took. Ma'alot, right, right after a massacre, they wanted to sort of send a message. This is Gush Emunim, 74, 76, 77, 77, 77, 78, 79. You see, the Gush Emunim people, they're going out. And by the way, uh, before 77, who's in power? Labor. Labor. And yet they wanted, they wanted Jews to settle. Who was crazy enough to go into the occupied territories? The religious Zionists. And they were very, they gave them incentives to do it. And so, the yeshivot were always established in settlements, right? Birkat Moshe, Malei Adamim, is that Efrat, or Etzion. Shvut Yisrael started before, it was actually yeshiva there before the city started. The city was founded really in 82, right? 79, 81, and then there was a pause, all right? But then after the first intifada started, they wanted to sort of reignite. Beit Arot, 90, 91, 91, 93, and you could see throughout the 90s. Uh, and these are ideologically driven, what should I call them? Uh, incubators of people who believe in this religious Zionist ideology of really most, mostly for Rav Cook. Was the pause related to Likud taking power? It was actually because uh, there was this focus on you know, the, the, tri- um, the 80, 78 or 79 to 82, dismantling Yamik, giving Sinai, so there was like a pause. They didn't want to agitate more because they wanted to have a, piece, a broader peace. Right? And then there were, uh, it was almost always political because then there was the Lebanon War. I mean, it, it wasn't a time to go start pushing. Um, but in the, in the 90s, this coincided with Oslo, right? 93, 94, 94, 94, 95. Like that's, it was a response to, uh, to Labor's uh, push towards the peace pr- Yes, actually the majority are. Right, so Siach Yitzchak is, is, uh, is actually near Gaza, but it's not in Gaza. Tzfat, so, so uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute. One of the new goals of religious Zionism in the 90s was to go to development towns. Like, in other words, there's, there's a chalutziut, there's a pioneering thing that we can do. It used to be to develop the, the, uh, the shtachim, the occupied territories, but even within Israel, there's ro- roles we could do. We can elevate the population, we can make people more religious. So there was a, 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 an effort to go and expand uh, their work there. But th- they, they need a calling, they need an ideological vocation, uh, if you will, okay? I mean, yeah, Modi'in, I mean, 2005. Some of these have closed, but for the... Right, Renana, I mean, just a hotbed of materialism, right? There's a, a, a Anglo-materialism. Right? So, huh? Okay, so... That, oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's for sure. All right, okay. 2011, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a more recent... I, I don't know why I can't get it on, on the web. 2011, 68 issue vote with 8,500 students. But you should know... They form the majority of the officer corps in the IDF. That's the key. Because they see it as a... Re- what did Rav Cook say? The army is a religious vocation. 
Because you're redeeming, you're holding on to your saving dues and you're holding on to territory. You're holding on to sovereignty. Okay? So this is really uh, remarkable. But the key events that have really shaken the, uh, the religious Zionist movement, obviously we had the 77 election, but the Egyptian peace treaty, what do you mean we're giving up territory? That's not the script. The script is once we have sovereignty, we keep it. What is this? Uh, Yamit and all that. The death of Tzvi Yehuda in 1983. There was a Jewish underground that was uncovered that was going to blow up the Dome of the Rock and it was intercepted. So this idea that violence could be, uh, oh no, isn't religion so pacifist? Yeah, rabbinic Judaism, that Talmudic Judaism that you rejected, right? That's the pacifist, right? We spoke about that, that on Sunday. That was the whole movement. But if you're going to take religious Zionism and say that um, arms and militarism are actually tools and vessels of the divine messianic process, so then you can start to justify a lot of things, really a lot of things. Uh, a Yesha council, the, uh, here it is, Yesha just stands for Yehuda, Shomron, and Aza, Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. The Oslo Accords, very much like, this is not, this is a reversal, right? This is uh, giving back the area that was biblical. Barak Goldstein's Hebron massacre on Purim uh, that killed Muslims while at prayer. And 1995, Rabin assassination by Yigal Amir, a member of the religious Zionist movement, right? They called him a weed who grew in the garden. You know, others said, no, that's what you're growing in your garden. No, it, it was a real spiritual uh, reckoning. Okay? So these are just some uh, pictures. Uh, right? And the Gaza withdrawal in 2005 was also very, very just unleashed. Right? And there was real talk of, uh, is this group going to cause a civil war? In the end, not, it didn't happen. But certainly the question of disobeying orders Right, if, you go to, if you have to evacuate. Okay? Now, as we close, and I'll take some questions, as we uh, near the end, I want to highlight a couple of things. I had an hour, okay? <laughs> right? To give you religious Zionism, there are so many flavors, more than haagen or whatever, Baskin and Robin, sorry. Right? There are flavors across the spectrum, and you shouldn't see it as just, I emphasized Rav Cook's version, because that's really the most prominent and he writes about it. But there are many, many other uh, versions. The other thing to highlight, which I think is a takeaway for, uh, for all of us as educators, we are living at a time now where, and I don't mean just Judaism, we are living at a time that violence and religion are actually closely associated in right, the common cultural mind. We actually think religious people are more likely to commit violence. But when you were living in the 1920s and 30s, right, fascists committed violence, right? uh, totalitarian states committed violence, the religious were kind of on the passive, pacifist end of things. And that could happen. Like, how many people know about what happened here um, in Burma, to the, to the I'm sorry, to the in Bangladesh, to the Rohingya. Okay, what is the official religion of Bangladesh? Buddhist. Buddhist. You ask anybody, Buddhist. Oh my gosh, the Dalai Lama. Oh, peace. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. If you're Buddhist, you oh, you it can't be a real Buddhist who did this. I'm sorry, right? Even, we're living at a cultural moment where Buddhism is perceived as pacifist in the in, in the cultural. Uh, uh, image, but it's the same thing with religion. So all ideological movements are not inherently connected to a political stance, meaning you can have a religious Zionist that is for the peace process. It's possible, but you could also have religious Zionists who are opposed to the peace process. It's not like, oh, because the majority today are, to, are, are opposed to it, if you're a religious Zionist, you must be opposed. That's not the case. And religious Zionism is a diverse movement. So I just want to show you a few Yoel Benun, after the Rabin assassination, he came up and publicly said, I reject what my, my ideology was cookie in. I see where it led. We were at fault, and he became a peace activist. Right? Took it on the chin, by the way. He just had a move. He was the chief rabbi of Ofra. He had to leave because right, his people didn't accept that. Um, and he also initiated modern biblical literary scholarship. 
Menachem from he died just a few years ago. He believed, he was in Tekoa, he believed that peace would come from religious people, not secular people. So he would, he did interfaith with, uh, these are Jains and Sikhs as well as uh, Muslims, and he really believed in reaching out to Palestinian neighbors. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda Amital passed away in 2010, the founder of Maimad, which was a religious Zionist movement that embraced uh, the peace movement. Um, and he actually became a minister in the government in nine, uh, after the Rabin assassination. Uh, Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein uh, died in 2015. Again, sort of the ideology of Hezder, but he advocated, even though his, his yeshiva is on the West Bank, the day after Sadat came to Jerusalem, he said, if peace were guaranteed to us, I would leave this new building tomorrow. They built the building in 77, 78. Uh, Sadat came and there was talk of peace. And he said, if for real peace, to save Jewish lives, we will evacuate. Not a popular stance. Um, other religious Zionist enterprises, Sohar, founded by these two uh, gentlemen, uh, by the way, went to the yeshiva of Amital and Liechtenstein. Tsoar uh, was improved interactions between religious and secular in Israel, particularly around marriage. You could see their uh, stuff from their website I put on the handout. This is, uh, we're running out of time, so you, you can read it. It's a great website. And they want to improve the, uh, the image of religious Judaism to secular Israelis. So that's still a religious Zionist project. All right, and you can go to their website. There's all about weddings and other things. Other religious Zionist enterprises, Taramit Sion, they send young men after they finish their uh, army and has their service, uh, and they stay for a year or two in, uh, we had it in Atlanta for about 10 years, um, and they're all around the world right now. Uh, these are, these are places that have religious Zionist kolels where they study for, with the community and they study among themselves. Moscow, has, uh, I visited there a couple of months ago, booming. A religious Zionist kolel in Moscow. Who would have thought? Right? Other religious Zionists, Beit Hillel, attentive spiritual leadership. They're trying to create ways of using Jewish law to increase the contact between um, religious and non-religious because unfortunately the media jumps on the ultra-orthodox and says their religion and they're saying no, no, no there is another form of Judaism that we can all embrace and celebrate and mutually respect that's their website um, and uh, just to so sort of sum up among the most Zionists of the religious Zionists are the pioneers right? uh, going out to, uh, to the settlements dedicated to army service we mentioned that especially the officer corps and they do this uh, sort of emissary work to Israeli cities, development towns, and outside Israel. Culturally, they still want to build bridges, women studying Torah, uh, so women getting involved, and they're seeking a resolution of the conversion crisis. You could see the website of Etim, a religious Zionist. And more, on the other hand, more association with the state. Uh, they want to reform the chief rabbinate, and they even created a Gavis and Medan Covenant and won an award in, I think, uh, 1995, I think it was. Common denominator for those with different beliefs to change the status quo and rebuild a new basis for uh, the, the uh, coexistence of religious and secular. Okay? There's also conflict. Uh, we can get into that. They, uh, these are all things from the last 10 years. Um, but it's a really fascinating thing to see how it has evolved uh, from opposed to anything Zionist, to embracing it on a pragmatic level, to embracing it on a mystical, messianic level, then retreating back to pragmatism, then becoming, after the Yom Kippur War, uh, much more driven ideologically, and now a diverse array of activities that typifies the community. So I'll just have a, a minute or two for questions. Thank you for your attention. A, there was a lot to cover. Any, uh, any comments, questions? Yes. It's, it, it's, ve it's, very, it's very, very hard. I would say the following. 
uh, I believe it's the Gutman Institute, did undertake a survey of religious, non-Haredi religious people in Israel and found that, uh, if you've heard the word dati light, right, that's, that came out of that report. Sort of how many times do you go to shul or how many times do you, you know, make sure about kosher? How, yeah, basically that would be the translation in, in, in our country. Um, so, no, but no, and they tend to be much less ideological on the political. And what we're finding is that the, the stricter, because of their learning in yeshivot, they're the ones who are. But the, the question was more about their religious observance, not about their po- politics. Uh, as far as I know, I could, I could ask around. I think the IDI would want to learn some of these, uh, some of these things. But you, you know what uh, came out, right? Right, uh, right after the, you know, the, during the coalition well, yeah. conversation. So that's kind of like, that's the fringe. Right, but then you say it's the fringe, which fringe makes me think it's not so many, but it, I don't no, know. But we know. but we know what the politics in this country show what a fringe of any party can do because of social media. They have an outsized resonance. You don't know the actual numbers, but you do. Right, right. so. Right. When I was living in Efrat, I remember there was an election. You know, just wait long enough, there'll be an election. So I was in Efrat, and like somebody uh, voted for Meretz in Efrat. Okay, so Meretz is like radically secular. So you know, people were wondering, like, you know, <laughs> checking, were you the one? Um, but Efrat is a city on the West Bank. But some people that were there because it was it was financial incentives, yeah. Right. So, no, I, I don't think. I, I will tell you that for the most part, the ones who go on in terms of army service, giving more years to the uh, country, um, they tend to be more ideological. Right. All right. Well, thank you for your attention. There's a lot more in this uh, conference, so enjoy it. Take away lots of treats. <laughs>